despite that resounding defeat, President Sadat's drive to address the Egyptian People's Assembly on the 16th was akin to a Roman triumphal march. He and General Ismail were mobbed as they entered the assembly. They had given the Egyptian people a tremendous victory, restoring their national pride. In his address, President Sadat described the crossing of the canal as a miracle by any military standard and went on to say the nation could feel safe and secure. It was now armed with a sword and a shield. But even as he spoke, a column of Israeli tanks was busy demolishing Egypt's shield. Not in Sinai, but in Africa. The Israelis had crossed the canal, and with no reserves to stop them, they were rampaging deep behind the Egyptian lines. Having identified the weak point where the Egyptian second and third armies met north of the Bitter Lakes, the Israelis had launched a counterattack on the 15th under General Sharon, forcing a passage through the Egyptian bridgehead and across the canal where it began destroying the missile sites. It had been a risky affair. The hardest battle had been on the eastern bank near Chinese farm, as paratroopers, armor and artillery fought for two days to stop the Egyptians from closing the gap behind the task force. Once across the canal, they'd found the ground undefended. The Egyptian armor was on the wrong bank. They moved freely over the Sweetwater Canal and began combined attacks on the missile batteries. Tanks covering the paratroopers as they swept through the bunkers. General Shazli was now at breaking point. He argued for the transfer of armor to the west, but Sadat dismissed the Israeli crossing as a mere television operation and secretly relieved Shazli of his command. It was the American airlift of military equipment to Israel that finally convinced Sadat of the gravity of his position. Material losses had been enormous on both sides, but he had expected the Israelis to grind to a halt long before his own Soviet supplies ran dry. Now he was forced to ask the Russians to arrange a ceasefire. Moshe Dayan had been against the crossing from the start, but had refused to make a decision either way. He told Elazar that he must decide on military grounds alone. But when they met in Sinai on the 19th, both knew that they now had everything to play for. How is your task force going on the other side of the canal? Oh, well, that's one of the, how do you say, 64,000 questions. Uh, how about the American equipment? Has any of that come into action yet? Oh, uh, what should I say? Yes or no? What's, what's good for our relationship? Anyway, we are very happy. We are creating the necessary conditions to open our major offensive. The Israelis now had two bridges across the canal, and their presence on the West Bank was growing stronger by the hour. They now tightened their grip on the towns and villages within an area of 1,200 square kilometers. The front line continued to expand, taking out more missile sites, punching a wider hole in the anti-aircraft umbrella which allowed Israeli planes to threaten the second army positions further north. Belatedly, Egyptian resistance was growing, both on the ground and in the air. This air attack on the 22nd of October ended minutes before the announcement of a ceasefire. The evident delight of these soldiers was not shared by all Israelis. No, I don't agree because the Egyptians uh, 
think that they succeeded in this war. They think that they, if they have placed some uh, few hundreds of soldiers and tanks in the, in our bank of the canal, then they think that this, this is a victory for them. And uh, when the Arabs think that they have won or they have a big victory, this is in, this encourages them. And the next thing you'll know is that in a year or two, we'll have another war and more casualties. But within hours, the ceasefire broke down. The Israelis seized their chance, dashing forwards to the outskirts of Port Suez. By the 24th, they had cut the Suez to Cairo Road at kilometre 101, and were only 60 miles from the Egyptian capital itself. The battle of the ceasefire transformed the situation. The Israeli drive had now trapped the Egyptian Third Army in Sinai, cutting all its supply lines. They now held a tremendous bargaining counter in the south. In the north, the elite Golani Brigade fought a bitter battle to recapture Mount Hermon, losing 70 men. Eight hours before the ceasefire on the 22nd, their pennant was raised alongside the Israeli flag on the summit. Now the Israeli flag flew in Africa too. As the second ceasefire came into effect, the two armies watched each other warily across the canal from reversed positions. This time, United Nations troops had been sent to enforce it and to arrange the passage of supplies through Israeli checkpoints. It was a remarkable turnaround. The initial Egyptian triumph had been cut from under them. A whole army was now dependent on Israeli goodwill in order to survive. Each side had lost territory to the other, but with the missile shield torn open and 20,000 Egyptians captive in the desert, the Israelis now held the upper hand. At kilometre 101 on the Cairo Road, for the first time ever, an Egyptian delegation arrived to negotiate directly with representatives of a country whose existence it did not even recognise. No one there would have believed that such a dialogue could continue, or that within four years, President Sadat would stand to address the Israeli parliament at the heart of the country he had fought so hard to destroy.